So what I want to talk about today is, is sort of broadly expressing yourself in R. And I, do, I don't mean like how you express your feelings in R, but how do you express a data analysis, which to me is the process where kind of raw data comes in one side, understanding knowledge and insight comes out the other. So what I want to talk about is a little bit of a sort of justification. So I, I really strongly believe that if you're doing data analysis regularly, it's really important that you learn how to program. So I'll talk a little bit uh, about that. So how many of you here are programmers? Okay, it's pretty much, pretty much everyone. Now, how many of you build tools that other programmers use? And yeah, a few, yeah, okay. That's interesting. So, so I, I, I think it's really important that you program if you're a data analyst. I, I think it's a, little, it's, it's a little strange to me that when I talk to statistics departments, I don't need to tell them that everyone should be programming. But when I come to a computer science department, I, I, I have to make that pitch a little bit more. And I, and I think it's the same way like statisticians strongly believe that if you're doing statistics and you're not a statistician, you're doing it wrong. Uh, similarly, computer scientists believe if you're programming and not a computer scientist, you're doing it wrong too. That's a little bit of a caricature. So if you're going to program, uh, why should you use R as a programming language? I'll talk a little bit about that and then talk about two of the projects that I've been working on, iterations of two of the tools that Michael mentioned, dplyr, which makes it easier to express your data manipulations, and ggviz, which allows you to express a new class of visualizations. So why program? To me, there are three main benefits. First of all, reproducibility. It allows you to redo the past and the present. This is really important for good science. You have to be able to recreate what you did. And, uh, and, and the, I really like the idea of provenance, that you can track your data from creation to the final artifact that uh, causes someone, influences someone to make a decision. Now, reproducibility is about recreating the past and the present. Automation is about preparing for the future in the present. So programming is really important because as new data comes in, as it does all the time, you need to be able to rerun your existing analysis, and you need to be able to re do new analyses that are closely based on existing analyses. Now, the final benefit of communication of code, and the one I think is most underrated, is that code is a vehicle of communication. Now, it's obviously a vehicle of communication between you and the computer, but it's also a really powerful tool of communication for between you and other people. And that's because code is just text. It's very, very easy to put code in an email to ask someone else how to fix your problem, or to Google for the answer, or to post your problem on Stack Overflow. Uh, this is a really, really important part of coding, I think. It's fundamentally a community process. And this is particularly so for R, since many R programmers, many R users are very, very task-oriented. They want to solve a specific problem. They don't want to learn the beauty and the uh, peril of programming. They just want to get their jobs done. So being able to quickly find an answer, whether it's in a book or on the web or on Stack Overflow, is really, really important. So if you're going to program, why use R? And I, I think to answer that question, you need to think about like what are, the, what are the bottlenecks in the data analysis process? And I think there are three main categories, or two main categories. First of all, you have to think about what you want to do. You've got to figure out what the, the next step is. Then you need to precisely describe it in such a way that the computer can understand what you want. In other words, you have to program it. And then finally, the computer has to go away and crunch some numbers. And in my experience, when you're doing a data analysis, the biggest bottleneck is cognitive. You spend way more time thinking about the problem than you do actually computing on the problem. And if, if that's the bottleneck, then you don't want to choose a programming language that's optimized for performance. It doesn't matter if you can do this 10, if you can do the computation 10 times faster, if the computation takes a second and you have to spend a minute thinking about it, right? You want a language, you want to pick a language that helps you think about the problem and then helps you express that in code. And uh, I think R is, is really well suited for that. The other thing is when you're doing a data analysis, you need the tools of data analysis, of which I think there are four uh, main parts. So first of all, what I call data tidying or data wrangling. This is a little bit like data cleaning, this is, but it's a bit simpler. This is just getting the data in a form that you can work with. 
So the arrow sort of goes here, but in reality, it's actually, you know, maybe all the way over here, right? That's often the, the, the hardest part of any data analysis project is just getting it into a form that you can work with. Now, once you've got it into your statistical analysis, your data analysis environment, you're going to iterate between three main sets of tools. So tools of transformation, which include things like creating new variables that are functions of existing variables, like uh, creating a, a variable density from uh, weight and volume, or it could involve simple ag aggregations like groups and sums, grouping and sums. You're also going to use visualization. The strength of visualizations, I think, are twofold. First of all, they're really useful because they uncover the unexpected. Visualizations can surprise you. And visualizations are also really helpful to help you refine your questions. This is often another big part of the data analysis process, is just making your question sufficiently precise that you can answer it. Now, visualizations surprise you, but they fundamentally don't scale because a human has to look at every single visualization. So to me, the complement of visualizations are models, by which I take very, very broadly to include all of statistical models and machine learning and data mining. But basically, whenever you can make a question sufficiently precise that you can answer it with a handful of summary statistics or a simple algorithm, I think of that as a model. So models are great because they scale very well. It's, always, it's almost always cheaper to buy more computers than it is to buy more brains. But models fundamentally do not surprise you. A model is never going to tell, some, tell you something that you did not expect. A linear model will never say your data is nonlinear or you've missed this interaction. So visualizations surprise you, but they don't scale. Models scale, but they don't surprise you. So in any real analysis, you're going to iterate between these tools many, many, many times. And I think R as a, as a language, as a, as a community for data analysis, provides many of the tools or all of the tools to attack all of these pieces of the problem. Now, there are lots of reasons not to use R, of course, and I certainly don't claim that R is the best programming language in the world. It is a very unique and quirky language, but I think it is very, very well suited to its domain. So the two main uh, drawbacks to R that people talk about are, is that it's slow, uh, which is true, but when you evaluate it, it's slow as a programming language, but that, that shouldn't be what you care about. You shouldn't be trying to optimize the speed of your programming language. You should be trying to optimize the speed of your data analysis. The other thing is that, that R has always really been designed as a language to glue together other high performance languages. It was originally designed to glue together command line Fortran and C scripts. So many of the computational bottlenecks in R have already been rewritten in high performance languages and R provides tools to make it very, very easy to connect uh, today as well. The other downside of R is that all of the data must fit in memory. It is fundamentally an interactive exploration environment. And to do that, really, all data must fit in memory. And, I, and, I, and people sort of talk about big data pretty loosely now um, without, I think, realizing, A, how big memory is these days. For example, on Amazon EC2, you can get a machine with 250, uh, 350 gigabytes of RAM pretty easily, and you can fit 100 million to a billion observations in memory for $3.50 an hour. So I, I think, by and large, kind of companies have big data problems. But to answer a specific question, it's usually very easy to get the data in memory through a combination of simple uh, subsetting or sampling or aggregating. Now, there, there's certainly lots of problems for which this is not true. But I think probably 95% of problems have people have far less than 100 million observations. So what I want to talk about first uh, today is dplyr, which is a tool to make data transformation easier. And I want to talk about it uh, in the context of this uh, little data set I put together, which is uh, from R package downloads in 2013, which comes from our CRAN mirror. So um, here I'm going to using the, the, the dplyr package. I'm going to load this data set into R, calling it logs. And then I'm going to print it out. 
Now, if you've ever used R before and you've printed out a data frame, it has some rather interesting defaults, like it will print the first 10,000 rows for you. Uh, typically, looking at 10,000 rows of data on your screen is not very informative. So dplyr does just some simple, thoughtful things like only showing you 10 rows by default. It allows you to see the data, uh, get some idea of what's going on, but it's not gonna overwhelm you with detail. Now, as you start to use bigger and bigger data, it starts to get really, really helpful to put comment, commas in places. So here we can see there's around 23 million rows of data here. So this represents the 23 million packages that were downloaded from our mirror in uh, 2013. Now, this isn't big data. This is data that fits easily in memory, but it's still 1.6 gigabytes. So that's a reasonable, that's hopefully by anyone's definition, that's a reasonable amount of data. And the goal of dplyr is to tackle both sides of this bottleneck, to make it easier to think about the data analysis, think about the data manipulation and what you can do and what you should do, and then to make it faster to actually do it. So the key insight to, to uh, making the cognitive bottleneck smaller is that by and large, there's only really a few key data manipulation verbs that you need for almost all problems, and they're the same regardless of where the data lives. So to me, there's five key verbs for manipulating a single table of data. So select, where you're picking a subset of variables of interest. Filter, where you're picking a subset of rows of interest. Mutate, where you add new columns that are functions of existing columns. Summarize, where you reduce multiple numbers down to a single number. And arrange, where you change the order of the rows. So one thing I think is interesting about this is that it's easy to think of a data frame or a table as a symmetric matrix. But that's really not the case. Data frames are fundamentally not symmetric. You have variables in the rows, observations in the columns, and so the operations are going to, the, the most important operations are going to work on rows and columns differently. Now, along with these verbs, you need some kind of a adjective, which is the group by. So many of these things you want to do by group. You want to do summaries by group. You want to do transformations by group. You want to do subsets by group. And I'll show you some of these examples shortly. So what I'm going to do is a little, I'm going to, what I want to do is find out how many packages or what packages are most frequently downloaded. So um, first of all, I'm going to group the logs by the package variable. So I'm creating something that represents, so I'm basically saying I want the unit of analysis of this data set to be the package. Next, I'm going to summarize that. So this is a grouped object, so this means I want to summarize it by package. How do I want to summarize that? Well, I want to do that uh, by counting the number of observations in each group. And then finally, I'm going to range it in descending order, and then I'm going to take the first 20. So I'm going to run this code live, hopefully. And uh, make that a little bigger so you can read it. So I've loaded the data in already because that takes about a minute. Uh, unfortunately, one of the, the current bottlenecks in R is just getting the data in can take a while. And now I'm going to run through those lines of code. And I'm using this function system.time just to show you about how long each of these things take. And so all up, doing this kind of group summary on uh, 20 million observations takes about two seconds. So this is, this is very much an interactive speed. You can iterate. Typically, the first summary that you do is not going to be the right one. You need to be able to rapidly change your mind, try out other things. And if we can run this code just to see what it returns, and uh, hopefully it doesn't seem too self-serving. Okay, so one of the things about the design of Playa is that it's, it's, it's very functional. The goal is that we have lots of little functions. Each function does one thing. It does it well. It takes inputs in a standard way. It never modifies anything in place. It's always going to return a new output. So the downside of that is when you're writing sequences of operations, you either have to sort of write a lot of intermediate variables or you have to write things, you have to nest things very deeply in parentheses. 
So one thing I sort of discovered or invented is this operation in R, this infix function percent dot percent. And what this basically does is a sort of a, a language manipulation. It takes an operation like this and it turns into an operation like this. So what it allows us to do, instead of expressing nested operations, it allows us to write them from left to right. So here is the same code I showed you before, but written using this percent dot percent, which is uh, rather like the pipe operator in uh, F sharp. So we take the logs, we group it by packages, we summarize it, creating a new variable called n, which is a count of all of the the, the, the number of observations in each group, we arrange it in descending order of n, and then we take the top 20 observations. So the goal is to create something that we can read very naturally, that should make it easier for us to write the code, and when we come back to our code uh, months later, you can still look at it and understand what the heck you're thinking. And so just to illustrate that that actually works, I can run that. And we have to repeat all those operations again. It takes about two seconds, and we see the top 20 downloaded packages. Quick question. Yes. It actually would make, in a sense, that makes debugging a little harder because you no longer have the intermediate variables that you can inspect. Yes. Yeah, so there's definitely, when I kind of discovered I could do this, I, I was a little uncertain as to how, whether people would like this idea or not. Because the, the disadvantage of this code is that there's, there's quite a lot of magic going on behind the scenes. It's actually kind of creating a call that has everything nested pretty deep, and it does make debugging a pain uh, a little more painful. Um, but you certainly can. If you, if you prefer to have easier debugging, then you can certainly write it like this. And Mike. Yeah, so I guess what I'm, what I, the way I normally work is I do something like this, like, you know, so mm. I write this and I check that it works. And then once I've checked that that line works, I write the next line. And once I verify that that line works, I write the next line. So I, so I don't imagine by and large people writing big blocks of code like this and then running it and then, um, well, actually, I do, I do very much imagine people doing that um, because my experience uh, teaching people R is that, that that's the, the biggest problem. If you say, go and write a function, what people do is they write a function that does everything and then they run it and it doesn't work and there's 15 possible places where there's an error and it's very hard to debug. So, so um, any analysis is in R is going to be very, very iterative. You're going to play around with things on the command line. You're going to try things out and uh, iterate your way to a solution rather than... Uh, writing one big expression. Now, of course, there's other, uh, you, you're typically not doing data analysis with just one table of data. You've got multiple tables, and the verbs here basically come pretty directly from SQL, uh, relational algebra. The most you, four most useful are the left four join and the inner join, which most people know about. The other two that are really useful are the semi join and the anti join. The semi join, uh, but this, these joins, are kind of like filters. They don't add any new columns. They just restrict the rows based on whether they match or not, don't match in the, in the other table. Now, as well as the cognitive side, dplyr aims to make the computational side more efficient as well. For local data frames, it doesn't do anything particularly magical. It just uses some efficient C++ code to avoid some of the many copies that R makes generally when you're working with data. Uh, one cool thing that we do, however, is we have implemented a little a, a miniature evaluator for R expressions of the nature that you commonly see in subsetting and mutating operations, which are usually using logical comparison or using summary functions like mean or min, and that allows us, when we're summarizing over thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of groups, to, uh, to avoid the overhead of uh, the R function call. This is our work joint done with uh, Romain Francois, who is a 
a vastly superior C++ programmer to me. Uh, and all of this stuff is just so obviously trivially parallelizable. You can always split up the data and have different threads working on different pieces at the same time. Uh, and we're currently working on exploiting that. So my sort of vision is with one of these big EC2 instances, you've got uh, you know, 300 gigabytes of RAM, you've got 32 cores, you should be able to do an interactive exploration with data on 100 million to a billion rows. So compared to, if you've used Plyr before uh, for some operations, so, so dplyr is generally 100 to 10,000 times faster than uh, Plyr. So I've had some gratifying tweets of people who say they switched from Plyr to dplyr and their code went from taking three hours to run to taking two seconds, uh, which is more of a testament to how bad Plyr was than a testament to how good dplyr was. But the goal of Plyr was always to be more about the cognitive side than the computational side. Now the other thing that's really important when you start working with bigger data sets is that you don't want to move the data around. The, the data is big and it's expensive to move around. So instead of moving the data to where the computation is, you want to send the computation to where the data is. And so dplyr has this idea of a, of a back end trying to abstract over the idea of a table of data where you've got rows and columns, which basically looks the same regardless of what system you're using to store it. So as well as some local sources like a data frame and a data table and a sort of experimental uh, data cube, you can also work with tables that are stored in a relational database. Uh, or things that are kind of like relational databases but aren't quite like uh, Google's BigQuery. So one thing I think that, that's really interesting uh, with many of the, the platforms for storing big data, they are by and large standardizing on SQL as a language for getting that data out. And if you wanted to make a bet on what languages people are still using in 50 years time to do data analysis, I would bet you a lot of money they will still be using SQL, which is only slightly horrifying. So what dplyr does is it allows you to keep expressing what you want in R and it's going to translate to SQL code for you. So the goal here is not to, is so that you don't have to understand how databases work or how you write or how SQL works, but allow it, the, the goal is to avoid some of the cognitive overhead of switching between R and SQL. And the, I think the cognitive overhead is by and large not because the languages are so different, but because they're so similar, but with some very subtle distinction which creates bugs that are very painful to, to figure out. So I'm going to show you a live example with a slightly different data set. Here we're looking at uh, the flight delay data set or a subset of that called H flights. Uh, not sure for Hadley flights, but uh, Houston flights. So if we look at this, we print this out, it tells us this data set is coming from Postgres. This is a, a data set that lives in a database and we're gonna just interact with it like we can interact with any other data source in R and dplyr is gonna automatically generate the SQL to talk to it for us. So you can see again, it's about 200,000 rows, which is not particularly big, but this illustrates uh, talking to databases. So I'm going to do an operation which I think is very natural but actually quite hard to express in SQL. I'm going to take this database, I'm going to group it by the tail number, or so I'm going to group, which is the unique identifier for each uh, plane. So I'm saying the unit of analysis is going to be the plane. I am going to mutate it. I'm going to add a new column called rank, where I'm just ranking the, the flights made by each plane based on how much they were delayed. And then in my final result, I am just going to show the three variables, the tail number, the arrival de delay, and the rank. So this is something that I think is fairly natural to express. So I'm going to run that, and it executes instantly, because it doesn't do anything. The key here is to be as lazy as possible. It's not going to fetch any data until I explicitly ask for it. And if you can look at this object, and you can see that there's a, a SQL query there, uh, it uses uh, window functions, which are an extension in SQL uh, 2003, which allow you to express um, some sort of some some of the things that's very natural to express in a vectorized programming language like R, uh, but in SQL.
We can also do lots of all the standard SQL things we can ask. We might be worried this is going to take a really long time to execute, so we could ask Postgres to explain its query plan, and if you understood Postgres query plans, you could look at this and tell me how long it's going to take. Uh, but I don't know anything about that, so I'm just going to run it. I know a little bit about it, but not that much. So you can see here, I've just typed it in, it's going to print it out, it's going to print out the first 10 rows, which unfortunately are not very interesting because they are, uh, seem to be uh, possibly a, a bug in the code, or possibly we have some planes without tail numbers and with no arrival delays and we've got some problem with the rank. But the goal here is that dplyne never does any work until you force it to ask for the data and always tries to do the minimum amount possible um, working in concert with the database. Here's another operation. This is a grouped, that was a grouped transformation, a grouped mutate. This one is a grouped uh, filter. So again, we take the data set, we group it by the tail number. Our unit of analysis is the plane. We're going to filter it so that the arrival de delay equals the maximum arrival delay. So for each flight, we get, for each plane, we're going to find the flight that was most delayed. And then I'm just going to show you the tail number and the arrival delay. Or maybe we should actually, we could add in that and look at the, I'll just look at the data set again just to make sure I remember the variable names, origin, mm, and dest, yeah. Okay, so let's run that. Again, it doesn't do anything, it's being lazy. The SQL it generates now is even more complicated because of the way that window functions work. You have to use a, wrap everything in a subquery. But, so this is, a, this is an operation that I think that's very, very natural, right? I can explain it to you. For every plane, give me the flight that was most delayed. And if you knew SQL, you could probably eventually iterate your way to this, uh, maybe with a little bit of Googling and using of Stack Overflow, but you would get there in the end. But here, um, dplyr kind of wraps that around so you express something that's natural in the data analysis, and uh, it's my problem to convert that into useful SQL, not yours. Again, we can explain that, or we could run it and see the first 10 rows which again takes a few seconds to run. So generally, if, you, if for anything you can fit in memory, that's going to be orders of magnitude faster than using a database since it has to go to disk. You can see all of these flights left George Bush International, and you can see the worst delays, are. these are all in minutes, right? So 300 minutes, so that's almost a five-hour delay. By and large, you don't see many delays higher than that because airlines just cancel highly delayed flights, otherwise their flight delay statistics look very bad. So as with any kind of real data where someone cares about some of these numbers, there's gaming that goes on. There's some, also some interesting stuff, like if you take these tail numbers and match it up with the FAA database of tail numbers, there's like a surprisingly high number of hot air balloons uh, that travel more than 300 miles an hour and serve commercial air traffic in the United States. <laughs> So, I mean, one of the things when you're working with data is you can basically never trust the raw data and you always want to be looking for these, these strange behaviors. So if you want to learn more about dplyr, uh, you can Google for it. There is a uh, GitHub page, there's a package on CRAN, you can use it. And there's a number of vignettes that go into more detail about the underlying principles. The other project I wanted to talk about today is called ggviz. Uh, this is joint work with Winston Chang. This is tackling the visualization problem and is aimed kind of squarely in the cognitive space. So the goal of ggviz, the three goals, so first is you want to be able to describe visualizations declaratively like you do in ggplot2. The graphics should be on the web, sorry, of the web, not just on the web, but of the web. It's going to produce things that are fundamentally web graphics. It's HTML, it's CSS, it's JavaScript. The, the sort of the goal is that you know you can do a fantastic visualization and you can show it to your boss or your advisor on their iPad, and they're like amazed at how awesome you are. 
And it's also built out of reactive components, reactive in the sense of functional reactive programming, which allows a declarative specification of interactive and dynamic behavior, uh, which uh, it's easier to show you, as I will shortly, than it is to describe. So as I said, it's aimed thoroughly in this cognitive domain. My feeling is, by and large, big, visual, big data is not a visualization problem. Big data is a modeling and summarization problem, which you then visualize. There's only so many pixels on your screen. You're going to have far more data points than you do have pixels. So when you're thinking about visualizing large data sets, you have to think about how can I summarize this down to something useful that I can gain insight from with just the few million pixels I have on my computer. So I'm going to show you this with a little demo. And I'm going to be using, uh, again, some data from the CRAN downloads. This time, I'm going to group it by date and I'm going to summarize it to count the number of packages on each day and also the number of distinct IP addresses. So in some, in some way, this is like the number of packages and how many people downloaded those packages. So I'm going to run that. It takes a couple of seconds to compute, and then I'm going to start doing some plots. So the main visualization function is called QVis, which is called for quick visualization, and you give it a data set. The data set's the first thing because that's the most important component of any visualization. Then you tell it what, should, what variable should go on the x-axis and what variable should go on the y-axis. So we have date on the x-axis and the number of downloads on the y-axis. And because we've specified two variables, we're going to get a scatter plot, uh, which isn't very useful here. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to say I don't want a scatter plot. I'm going to override the default choice and I'm going to use a, a line plot. So we can drag this out, and if we pop this out into another window, you'll see it just opens up in Chrome. This is just some HTML, some CSS, some JavaScript, and if you look at this, if you're familiar at all with uh, Vega, which is a declarative plot specification by Jeff here, we're using Vega as the rendering system, so we're just sending this declarative JSON to the browser, and the browser is going to render that for us. So this is a plot of the number of uh, packages downloaded each day. What's kind of the biggest, what, what's the pattern that jumps out most clearly here? Weekends, right? So fewer packages downloaded on the weekend, which is telling you uh, something not terribly surprising, and that's most people use R for work, not for uh, fun. <laughs> Although there still are a lot of downloads on the weekends. One interesting thing we've seen um, with some other data is that on the weekend, it tends to be a slightly higher proportion of Macs during the download than during the week, uh, which is, I think, a little interesting. <laughs> so instead of showing the number of downloads per day, we could show our approximation for the number of people downloading. And it's, so this is interesting, like when we look at the number of people downloading, the pattern is much, much, much more regular. I'm not sure why that's the case, but what we could do is look at the average number of packages downloaded per person, and this just sort of illustrates that when you're doing a visualization, you want to be able to do inline transformations. I want to look at the number of packages divided by the number of IP addresses. And so there's some interesting variability. Some of these spikes I can explain. I think this one here and this one represent new releases of R. So when you download a new version of R, you have to download all of your packages again. I have no explanation for these other spikes. These ones are particularly interesting, like the 1st of September. Uh, it may be that these represent like big online R course online courses starting, because typically if you download, even if you download like ggplot2, you have to download about 30 other packages uh, that it depends on. So visualizations are a very iterative process. If we go back to this original plot, looking at the, sorry, if we go back to the, yeah, this plot of looking at the number of 
IP addresses per day, unique IP addresses today. Once we've seen this weekend pattern, we're probably not that interested in it. We might be more interested in what's the long-term trend in package downloads. So we might want to add a smooth line overlaying it. So here, I'm just providing a vector. I'm saying I want both lines and a smooth overall fit, and it's going to add a low S curve to the plot. Now, of course, whenever you add a smooth to a plot, or whenever I add a smooth to a plot, I'm always like, well, that's not the right amount of smoothing. So I'm going to show you a slightly more specific way of writing that exact that plot, and then show you how you can control the amount of smoothing. So here I'm using a slightly fuller specification. QViz is a little bit magical. It tries to guess some things for you. Uh, GGViz is a little bit more explicit. We say the data we want is this downloads data set. The visual properties put date on the x-axis, put the number of IP addresses on the y-axis, add a layer of lines, and add a smooth layer on top of that. Now we can control the amount of smoothness using the span parameter. So I could set the span to 0.9, the span is a number approximately between 0 and 1. I could make it 0.8, run that again, well that's not wiggly enough, I could make that 0.7. Right, parameter space exploration by changing a number and rerunning code is obviously really, really painful. So what I'm going to do is define a new object which represents a slider. So this is a slider that goes from 0.1 to 1, and it's going to start at 0.5. And then in my plot, I'm going to say, make the span of the smoother, map it to the slider. And when I do that, I'll pop this out so it's a little easier to see. When I do that, I get a slider, and as I drag the slider, I can control how wiggly that smoother is. So you'll notice here there's no, here we've got some, um, the plot updates as a response, in a response to the slider, but we don't have any, we haven't written so many explicit observers to say update the plot when the slider changes. Is yep. That running, has it pre-computed all values in the slider? Or is it, or no, it's back in, back to R? Yeah, so I should mention if we pop this out, you'll notice this URL is a local web server, so every time I drag this, it asks R to recompute the smoother. So this is designed fundamentally to have, an, for every visualization, you have an instance of R running in the back end. Now that, like if you're the New York Times, that would clearly be an awful idea, right? You need to have hundreds of thousands of R instances running in the background. But for, the, for our goal, which is to make exploratory data analysis easier, this is absolutely what we want because you're only limited by what R can do and uh, that's not much of a limitation when it comes to statistical modeling. So I'm going to close that down, and of course, you know, you can easily map pretty much any other HTML uh, input component. So this is a pretty lame one, but you can just see I'm changing the color of the line. And the system is intelligent enough that when I change the color of the line, it's not going to ask R to recompute that line. It knows the color. Uh, is independent of the computation. So, so GGViz is built on this, this idea of reactive components, so components which don't just have a single value that's fi fixed in time, but have values that change over time, that are fundamentally reactive. And the thing that's neat about building on top of this reactive framework is that it doesn't really matter why those values are changing. So rather than binding uh, a parameter to a control, we could bind it to this thing uh, I've called waggle, which is just going to animate values between 0.2 and 0.1. So doing exactly the same thing here, I'm saying the span is just this waggle component, and now I have an animation exploring this space. Now this is kind of a, a not, this is not a terribly interesting example, but the thing that's neat about the framework is this animation is just a stream of values coming on. And that's exactly the same as if you've got streaming data with new values coming on, that this framework is fundamentally reactive so that as your data changes, so too does your plot. Or another source of reactivity is the keyboard. Here I've bound the uh, span to the 
the left and right arrow. So as I push the keys, I can interactively experiment with the smoothness. Sorry, is there any way to back the value that looked good out of that plot? Uh, yes, there is, but not currently. <laughs> um, so so that, that, that's something that is uh, achievable within this framework. We just haven't implemented it yet. So as well as these binding simple controls or simple uh, streams of values to parameters of the plot, we can also add uh, slightly uh, more higher level interactions. So for example, in this case, I'm gonna add a tooltip. A tooltip takes a callback function. It's given some data about the point under the mouse and it returns some HTML, which in this case is just going to be a number. So when we mouse over the points, you can see exactly how many IPs downloaded packages on that day. Or instead of a tool tip that works with just a single value, we can make a tool tip that works with a brush in here just showing the total number of IP addresses under the brush. Uh, which updates as you move it, although you'll see there's some bugs and it currently doesn't under unbrush the points, but. Um. So ggviz is sort of, has mostly been an experiment, is so far is sort of a proof of concept convincing me that a declarative specification of a visualization plus reactivity is like a grammar, I think, of interactive graphics. It allows us to specify a very large variety of interactions. Um, and, when I, and when I mean it allows us, it kind of, I mean it allows you that I don't have to pre-specify every possible interaction. You can come up with new interactions uh, that make sense for your data. So ggviz, similarly, if you want to learn more, you can Google for it. There is a GitHub page. Uh, there are some vignettes that describe more about the underlying philosophy, more about how the reactivity works at a fairly deep level. And uh, it's, it is, uh, it's, it's usable, but the demo I just showed you was carefully constructed to make it look as impressive as possible. Um, and so there are currently a lot of little, little things that make it a little bit frustrating to use, but we're working uh, very hard to make those uh, not such a problem. So in conclusion, I think it's really important when you're thinking about how can you make better tools for data analysis, better tools to understand data, you think about all of the bottlenecks, both computational and cognitive. You have to make tools that make it easy to think about a problem, make it easy to describe that pro problem programmatically, and then make it easy to compute with it. And certainly in my experience, the biggest bottleneck is cognitive. You spend way more time thinking about the problem than computing on it, which means by and large that research effort it should be focused on making it easy to think about data analysis, not making it easy to do it computationally. So you, you want tools that help you define the problem, make it, make it easier to express your ideas about how to solve the problem. And I think R is really well suited for this as sort of a host language for developing domain-specific languages. So data analysis in many ways is sort of a combination of a sequence of domain-specific languages. You want a domain-specific language to express how to get your data out of whatever format it's in into R. You want a domain-specific language to express data manipulation. You want one for visualization, and then you want one to describe your models. And then the rest of the programming language just sort of how helps you um, do things like for loops where you know, well, I've got six variables, I'm gonna explore them all in the same way, I'm gonna write a for loop to do that, rather than copying and pasting my code multiple times. So if you'd like to get a copy of the slides, uh, which I presume I'll also give to Michael so he can put them on the website, but you can download them from this URL here. Thank you.
So uh, you started out with this idea that programming is the right way to interact with these systems. Uh, and I just want to push you on it a little bit because I think there's a little bit of a tension between that claim and uh, this conclusion about domain-specific languages yeah. in, in the sense that what you're doing is creating uh, uh, small-scale uh, ways of interacting with visualization, for example, in GBGVis that don't require programming or in uh, dplyr that are much closer to natural language mm -hmm. semantics. In some sense, these seem like perfect candidates for taking these and saying, okay, now let's put a natural language semantics on top of that uh, and we'll just say stuff. Or let's put a click and drag semantics on this and you can just add your tooltip by clicking the tooltip icon. Yeah. Why not do that? So I, I think... There's two, I think there's two reasons not to do that. So the first one is these tools are fantastic for like the most common 80% of tasks. The other 20% of tasks don't require five tools to solve them. They require like 500 different tools. And if you're like locked into this box where you can only express the most common 80% of operations, that means like you're always, you, there's lots of things you can't do because you need to do some special case. Um, but also, I think it, the, the, the advantage of embedding everything in a programming language is you're never like limited by what I think. Um, you're never sort of locked into an environment where you can only do what Hadley thinks is the right thing to do. You can always break out of that and do what you think is the right thing or what someone else does. You can integrate this with other people's um, code. I think also if you are, even if you were to create a, like a GUI or some kind of nice interface around this, like it makes sense to develop the language first. And it is, I think it's like de developing, to me like developing the language is the sort of the easy part, then developing a toolkit to express that. that that's, uh, that's another hard problem. And if you then later on discover, oh, I've actually missed a really important part, then you've got to totally rethink your toolkit. And then again, um, like having this, I guess, so you're arguing a natural language. So you still have sort of, you, you always want text in the end, right? And whether that's like an embedded DSL or an external DSL, I, I think that that's sort of a, it doesn't really matter. But having it embedded in a programming language is so important to break out of that box when you need to. I was just curious in hearing your thoughts sort of long term, where does Shiny and ggplot2 and ggviz where, how are they going to sort of fit into each other eventually? So I, I should have mentioned that um, so ggviz is using Shiny under the hood. All of the reactivity comes from it. Whenever you create a plot, whenever you create an interactive plot, that's actually a Shiny web application running behind the scenes. Um, in terms of ggviz versus ggplot, in, in some ways they're complementary. Like ggviz is aimed squarely, so ggplot2 is aimed squarely at print graphics. ggviz is aimed at web graphics. If you want to make a PDF or a printout or a book, right, having an interactive something doesn't matter. You want just something you can easily get into a PDF and, and do what you want with. Um, that, that said, like, there's only one of me and I can't like work simultaneously on ggplot2 and ggviz and make progress on both. So lately ggviz has sort of, a ggplot has been rather fallow um, and I, I think what we're going to do in the near future is basically say ggplot2 is now in maintenance mode, we'll fix major bugs, uh, we'll accept pull requests but we're not going to do any active development. One thing that's really challenging with ggplot2 now is that there's such a, a large community of people using it that there are well-known bugs that people have come up with workarounds for that if I was to fix the original bug would break all of the workarounds. And so the net effect of fixing a bug is actually to break more code than not fixing it. Um, and this sort of ties in a little bit generally with the, the tooling around making reproducible code and R that keeps running that we're working on in, in other ways. I want to push a little bit back on this notion of like what you want to do with a PDF is different than what you want to do with web graphics. You could imagine you know, the future of science in some sense should not be PDFs. Yes. Right? We should be creating papers that have these graphics that I can interact with. Yeah. You can imagine creating some, I, I know you shuddered at this notion, but think about like the managed service, like the Heroku equivalent, you know, yeah. our Roku or whatever, yeah. where I can specify these things and now part of my, my research result or whatever I'm doing for my company gets hosted by this site. Yeah. And then anyone else who looks at it can actually play with it. It goes yeah. against the, the back yeah. of the calls. Um, I feel like that's going to end up being, you know, or even <coughs> imagine, allow, allow me to, to fork that data set and mess yeah. with it myself. 
Yeah. I mean, why are we why are we stopping at a single? Yeah. Language? I mean, so I would, I would say I mean PDFs generally are like the past, right? And interactive web stuff is the future. I, I don't think you'd argue with me that interactive HTML is what that's going to be, right? It's not going to be Wolfram's computational data format, for example. Um, the other thing that I, that the other thing that I've been working on, which is sort of similar to this, is I've been writing a book, uh, which I. I don't know if I can connect to the internet quickly. Try. None of those look very uh, visitory. But I've been writing a book in the open. It, I'm writing it in R Markdown, which you can render into uh, Markdown, which gets rendered into HTML. And the book is just a GitHub repo. It's 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 all published on the website and has an edit this page button, much like a wiki, but instead of editing the page directly, it edits it in GitHub, and then when you click save, it submits a pull request to me. So then I can review the pull request and integrate that. And that, that's firstly like a really fantastic like collaborative writing environment. And I think it, it used to be a wiki, and since I, since I switched to the system where I review every change, people actually submit more changes because they know I'm going to look at it. The other piece of technology that's really cool is in that is using Travis, which is a continuous integration system. So anytime a change gets pushed to GitHub, everything gets, all of the code gets rerun, all of the HTML gets regenerated and pushed to the book website. And we are certainly imagining a future where you're not just pushing static graphics, but you're somehow kind of pushing the live interaction there as well. Um, and then that's sort of like, Thinking about being able to write books which have interactive components which people can play with and all that kind of stuff is really, really exciting. I was wondering if um, I've played around a lot with IPython. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can contrast, like, say, our studio and IPython. So my understanding is IPython has like plugable black backend that you can actually yeah. do different. So the IPython has this sort of notebook interface where you have cells of input and output, and you can intermingle uh, rich text and your code. Uh, the sort of the equivalent in the R community. So, so while you can put an R back into I, IPython, um, by and large, what the, the R community uses is, is this tool called R Markdown, which. Uh, let me just quickly pull up. So R Markdown uh, is a similar idea. So you can intermingle rich text written in Markdown with R code. When you execute the document, the R code is run, and the environment, the, 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 the code and text, are the, the results and text are interleaved. So the main difference is with the, sort of the, the IPython philosophy is you have one file which contains uh, the code and the results of running that code. In the R Markdown philosophy, you have one code, one file that's the input, which contains the code, and then you have one file which is the output. So the advantage of the IPython uh, approach is that you've got one file to email, but for someone to read that, they need to use a special viewer because the document's just a JSON data structure. The advantage of um, the R Markdown approach is you can just some, email someone an HTML file or, or a PDF but then they can't kind of run the code in such an easy way as, as IPython. So I, so I think like R Markdown plus an IDE is effectively equivalent in expressive power to like a notebook, or it, it gives you very similar tools. Um, but I, I think that's a really interesting space to explore and generally like the different ways of intermingling documentation or text and code to, to explain things is I, I, we're just sort of still starting to see what the different approaches are and, and what are, what's going to win out. This sort of a slider that you could set the level of smoothing with. I wonder mm -hmm. what's the scope for this kind of interactive sort of playing with the graph? I mean, could you have a Dropbox of like a categorical variable, or could you have multiple of these that get updated when you like select this Dropbox? The other ones also get updated. Or so that 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 sort of like sequence of Dropboxes where each felt progressively filters is not. Um, something you could do that easily. I've showed you, what, what I showed you was kind of the, the, uh, 
very concise format where you're using kind of components that we've built like the, um, you know, I'm using components like the, the, the drop down or the slider. You could also write your own components using any HTML, right? If you wanted a, a date picker, you could write an HTML date picker. You're going to have to know some HTML and JavaScript if you want to do that and hook it up to a, an R object that represents that. So if you, if you know a little bit about HTML, you can add some of these structures. Uh, some of them you can do if you write a shiny app and just use our existing things. Otherwise, you are a little bit constrained with what kind of fundamental input elements we have written already. So I guess it's kind of was discussed before that like debugging is very hard in this kind of like describing model, right? Yes. I wonder what's your vision on that. I mean, is it possible to also have a way of, I mean, if you are doing this multiple piping of data together, is it yeah. a way that kind of like you could tell the user immediately that if any of this like pipe is fading or something? Yeah, I think there's um, a lot of scope for better debugging tools. And another problem you can imagine now, if you've got a, a graphic that's dynamically changing over time, and at some point it breaks, like that is going to be an incredibly frustrating debugging experience. And I, I think there's still a lot of thinking to do with what, what, what better tools you could come up with. One thing that I can imagine very easily um, is the sort of some of the, the, the Brett Victor idea. So in maybe when you're typing this and I push enter, you could imagine getting a little preview that shows the first few rows. And so I could check immediately, have I done the right thing or not? I, th I think that, that that feedback loop, we find out as quickly as possible, have I done the right thing or not, is really, really important. And um, since you know, I'm working with the people writing the IDE. There's a lot of scope to add that kind of interaction. So you mentioned how programming is advantageous um, because of the provenance, you, know, you can tell where a result came from mm -hmm. very clearly. Um, it seems like with this model where they kind of, you know, you, you create a graphic and then publish it, um, and the published product is a web address that someone goes to and plays with, it yeah. seems like at that point the graphic, you know, is now disconnected from the code that made it. Um, is GG doesn't have anything where you know a graphic sort of knows about how it got created, it can tell its audience. That is not something we've thought about. I think generally our, our model is if you did want people in, to understand how it was created, you would also publish the source code along with it. Um, I mean, one one thing we've thought about is also the ability to kind of publish an interactive graphic by pre-rendering a number of the computations so it doesn't have to hit R every time, it just stores everything in the JSON. And there at least you'd have the data stored in the document even if you wouldn't have all of the calculations. Um, I, I think there's a similar, like with, with reproducibility, there's only ever so much you can reproduce, right? You can reproduce the actions that someone take, took, but it's very, very, you can't like reproduce their thought process, which led to those actions, which you could then reproduce a data analysis with a new data set, right? So there's, there's sort of always limitations and like we'll kind of keep pushing it as, as far as we can, but. It seems like you could just embed the code in the HTML, like a. Yeah, I, again, I think that that's just not, like that, that's sort of more the notebook style, which is not the way that we've been thinking currently, but that's a certainly a valid way to do it. And I, I think, um, I would imagine that it would, wouldn't be too hard to hook up IPython so you could have like GGVis graphics that would work interactively in the notebook as well. So you started with this claim, which I agree with, that the, you want to take advantage of the things that people are already good at um, that computation, <coughs> like computation is of the order of the fact that it's, yep. it's uh, the, the proximity of the language's description to how I think about the problem. Yep. And if this is the case, you know, and you look at what people are learning first, like what are what are their homes when people start scripting? You're not looking at R, to be honest. You're looking at like HTML and JavaScript, which is where like many many people start. Yeah. And I wonder what this would look like if you flipped it around and you said, let's take these same verbs yeah. and make JavaScript as you know the base yeah. language, yeah. make it massively yeah. 
data parallel in, in these same ways simply yeah. by, by you know, embedding the script. And then anything that someone wants to do on the visualization side, there's already very rich yeah. uh, visualization that can come out of the yeah. general JavaScript. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think your, your sort of, your, your question is like, why use R as a home for data analysis as opposed to JavaScript in some sense? Well, I mean, starting with your assumption, that's sort of another possible. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And I think, um, you know, I, I think there's sort of two main contributions of this work. And that first is that intellectual framework, like these are the five verbs. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to go and implement a JavaScript thing, you can use those ideas. Um, and if you do that, then that, that, that's like success for me as a researcher, right? That I found something that's useful. Um, but for me to go and do that, then I have to go and learn JavaScript, right? Um, so it's all the sort of like, like relative costs. And I, I think JavaScript, so, so it's, I think that would make, that could make a more approachable data analysis platform for many people who have learned JavaScript already. Um, on the other hand, it's going to make the, the, the thing that JavaScript is weakest in is the, the modeling side. So if you're, gonna, if you're gonna be in JavaScript, then well, you can do the visualization and transformation, but now you're also gonna have to implement a whole lot of statistical models. Um, and then that, that's basically how it is in every language, right? Every language provides some of the pieces and you have to do a whole lot of work to provide the final one. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work to date building these pieces in R and um, it seems silly to throw it away just because lots of people know JavaScript. Um, and JavaScript is interesting though, because I think um, it, it's very, very similar in many ways, both as a programming language that's lexically scoped, and um, if you, if it's, there's a lot of interest in functional programming now, and also as sort of a community where like most JavaScript code is crap, and most R code is really bad, and you know, there's, there's, there's like, like Douglas, yeah, the Douglas Crockford's JavaScript, the good parts, there's, there's sort of like R, the good parts as well. So.